God today. Standing on the promises of Christ my King, through eternal ages let His praises ring. Glory in the highest, I will shout and sing. Standing on the promises of God. Standing, standing. promises to look forward to and to hold on to today. That his promises are yes and amen, he says in his word. He has already claimed it. And I just want you to know that today. And no matter what you face, no matter what you go through, as we've said many times, find a promise in the word of God. There's so many that you can hold on to. And then when storms come, when trials may feel like they're just falling over you, just stand on that promise. Hey, one of them is He will never leave us and He will never forsake us. He is always there in the midst of everything that His children go through. He is a Savior. He is our cornerstone today. That is where our hope is built. Amen? That's where our faith lies. In Jesus Christ. Amen. We worship you today. Thank you, Lord Jesus.
Lord, today. Thank you, Jesus. Christ alone, cornerstone, weak made strong in the Savior's love. Through the storm, He is Lord, Lord of all.
as Brother John keeps playing that song, I just can't help but wonder, is there at least one in this church who's willing to praise God for his goodness? Is there perhaps maybe 10 people that'll give God praise for his goodness? Do we have a church that's truly thankful for his faithfulness and for his goodness? As we sing that song again, let's just give God praise for who he is. Let's give God praise for what he deserves because he has been faithful to you. He has been good to you. Despite what we face, he's been faithful. At the core of who the Lord is, he is faithful. Before he loves you, he's faithful to you. Before he heals you, he's faithful to you. Before he protects you, he's faithful to you. We serve a faithful God. When you and I aren't faithful, he's still faithful. That's what his word tells us. Can we just praise him in this place today? Voices, church, just your voices all my life. All my life, you have been faithful. Thank you, Jesus. And all my life, you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. Father, we thank you for your faithfulness. We thank you for truly being a good, good Father. Lord, we thank you for your presence that's in this place today in a real and in a mighty way. Father, thank you for showing up and showing out. Thank you for the worship that we can partake in, Father. Thank you for this. I give honor to this praise team, for the singers, musicians, for ushering in your presence, Father. So as we enter a time where we break bread and get into your work, Father, I pray that these words that I'm going to speak that came from you fall on good and fertile soil. And Father, that lives are changed. And if there be one here today who's not saved, that today be the day of salvation. Father, we love you. We praise you and honor you. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen and amen. Can we give our praise team a hand? If you can just remain standing for a little bit with me, I, I like to, when I, when I read God's word, I like, to, I like to have you to stand. The scripture I'm coming from today is 2 Peter 1, verses 2 through 8. If you remember, if you've been with us on our Wednesday night studies, we went through a book by Dr. David Jeremiah entitled, Everything You Need. It talked about God's promises and how we could grab a hold of them and how he would give us everything we need to make it through this life. So that we, we really took some time, Pastor Mark and myself, to really break that down and to really get into that. So I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come from that again, but I'm, I'm coming from somewhere completely different. So if you were here on those Wednesday nights, don't, don't think that Hayes will repeat because this is something completely different. Lord, give me something completely different out of this passage. But here's what the word says. Grace and peace. That spiritual sense of well-being, and I'm coming from the Amplified, be multiplied to you in the true, intimate knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. For His divine power has been bestowed on us absolutely, listen to this, absolutely everything necessary for a dynamic spiritual life and godliness through true and personal knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and excellence. For by these he bestowed on us his precious and magnificent.
promises of his inexpressible value so that by them you may escape full freedom that is in this world and become shares of his divine nature. For this very reason, applying your diligence to your faith, develop more excellence and in more excellence knowledge and in knowledge self-control and in self-control steadfastness and in steadfastness godliness and in your godliness brotherly affection and in your brotherly affection develop Christian love that is learn to unselfishly seek the best for others and to do things for their benefit for as the qualities are yours and are increasing they will keep you from being useless and unproductive in regard to the true knowledge and greater understanding of our Lord Jesus Christ. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for your word, Father. Your word is real. It is powerful. It is truth. And Father, as we break the word today, as we bring forth what you've given us, Father, I ask now online and in person that you open up ears, eyes, minds. Father, open up hearts so that your word is heard, it's received, and it's planted in good and fertile soil. And Father, that it takes root and grows. Father, it's nothing about me. I ask you now to decrease me so you can increase. But it's about you today, Father. Thank you for your many blessings. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. You may be uh, Before I get started, uh, you know I always I like to do this. I give honor to our pastor and his wife at the church. Can we just give them a, a hand clap this morning of praise and thank them for what they do? I know they're not here. Um, pastor's turning another year older. So, yeah, so yeah, I promise it's okay for a pastor to get away and enjoy family time. They, they deserve it. Um, so they're, they're actually going away for a little mini getaway, him and Zoe and Miss Lynn. And I'm jealous, just to be honest. The Bible tells us not to be jealous, but I, I'm a little jealous. They, they went away without me and Taylor. But um, they're having a good time. I know they are, and we're praying for them, and, and we do honor them. If you get a chance, his birthday is the 22nd. I'm not telling you what to text or do. Just don't text him, happy birthday, old man. Just say happy birthday, young man. He's still young. Keep him, keep him young in his mind. But we do, Pastor, love you if you're watching, which I know you are, Miss Lynn. We thank you all for y'all's leading and guidance and, and being shepherds of our house. Um, the title of today's message is The Power of God's Promises. If you were here last Sunday, and if you won't, I'll catch you. I'm not going to go back and reteach or repreach it. Pastor does a good enough job. But last Sunday, Pastor told us the need for discipleship. How many of you have heard that word? If you've been to this church, how many of you have heard that word at some point in time? Whether it's, you've seen it in a brochure before COVID, whether it's on the screen, it's been preached, it's been taught in our Sunday schools. We are firm believers of discipleship. And that means we believe in teaching and preaching the God's word. We believe in being learners of God's word. Because you can't teach and preach something that you don't have. So you have to be able to have God's word in you to give it up. But we believe, we believe in following what the Bible says. We believe it is the absolute truth. It is infallible, without error. It is God's written word. From Genesis to Revelation, it's complete. We believe that. So discipleship is important. He talked to us about the importance of God's word when it comes to discipleship. Remember, he said you can have all the gatherings you want to have and cookouts and stuff's fine. We're not, we're not bashing those. But you can't truly call it discipleship if you're not breaking this bread. You can break all the bread you want physically, but if you're not breaking the, breaking the spiritual bread, it cannot be called discipleship. So we, we believe that. And Pastor, give us three things of how this works. The Word of God needs to be used for our devotion. You remember him saying that? For our direction and our development in our lives. And that is important. You see, Pastor also told us this, that this Word has principles that we need to obtain. You know what principles are? They're absolute truths. It's not, well, it's... It's my, this is my truth and your truth meant no. The word of God is absolute truth. There's no, I don't care what the world says about what is a relative truth. That may be true for you, but not for me. At the end of the day, when we all stand before Almighty God, there's only one truth. And, and sadly, some people will find that out the wrong way. But we can pray for them that the Lord will convict them and save them. But today, I want to link my message with his from last week. I want to tell you this, that along with those principles, there are also promises. And those promises... We can absolutely trust, without a doubt. Amen. If the Lord's word says it's yes and amen, what pastor tell you? Lord, you said it. Amen. Yes, he said it. We can trust him. So let me ask you this this morning. What is a promise? If you had to really think about it, what is a promise? The simple definition is it's a word of honor. 
It's a vow. It's an oath. It's a pledge. It's a guarantee. You see, a promise is a declaration or an assurance that someone will do, give, or arrange a particular thing. Let me ask you this. How many of you have ever had someone break a promise to you? I'll raise, I'll raise both my hands. I'm going to raise both my hands for these two. Now, how many of you have ever broke a promise? I've been there too. You see, let's be honest, we're in church. How many of you have ever had doubt or even times of discouragement where you wondered if God was really going to live up to his promises in your life? I'll raise both my hands again. We all have. Unfortunately, people will break their promises. For whatever reasons, excuses will come up, but they'll break. Man, I, I promise you, I'll be at that, your birthday dinner. The birthday dinner comes and you're somewhere else. You're not there. I promise you I'll come visit you if you ever need me where that person happens to need you and you never visit them. For whatever reason, we break promises. However, the Lord isn't that way. If he said it in his word, guess what? He'll do it. It's a guarantee. At the very center, and I just told us this, at the very center of who the Lord is, he is faithful. He is, before he loves you, he's faithful. I know we like to preach God is love, and he is love, but he has to be faithful in order to love you. Before he forgives you of your sins, he is faithful. Before he heals you, protects you, does anything else for you, the Lord is faithful. I like to do this example. If you have an onion, you know the onion's got a core. If you start peeling off, he protects, he heals, he provides. You can peel all those things off, love and good and great and merciful and grace. At the very center is faithful. The very center of that is faithful. That's who God is. You know, we also serve a God of covenants. We don't serve a God of contracts. You know why? Contracts have an expiration date. I'm going to sign this contract from 2022 to 2025 to work for you. At 2025, I may be somewhere. Mm -mm. We serve a God of covenant. You know what that covenant means? Covenants aren't broken with God. If there's a covenant in his word and he said it, it lasts all through it. What's the Bible say? When everything else fades away, when heaven and earth passes away, when, up, when we pass away, when all of our nice cars and nice houses we're building and all of our fancy stuff deteriorates and just is destroyed, the word of God will still stand. It will still stand above all else. He's a God of covenants. You see, and there's power in those promises. Not just is there power, listen to me well, there are benefits and there are blessings that come along with those promises. The first one I want us to look at today is this. God's promises will settle your soul. Take that in real. They will settle your soul. And you can substitute soul for heart, however you want to do it. Grace and peace. Verse 2 said, grace and peace be multiplied to you through the knowledge of the Lord. Notice what Peter's saying here. Grace and peace are multiplied through what? The knowledge, knowledge of the Lord. What Peter is saying is we can receive abundant. We can receive all the grace and knowledge we want, but it only comes through knowing the Lord personally, through having that knowledge with him, not knowledge of knowing about him. We can come and sit in church every Sunday and know about the Lord. We can be raised in Sunday school and know about the Lord. We can have good Christian parents and grandparents and know about the Lord, but that's different than knowing the Lord. You can, head knowledge and heart knowledge is two different things. In my head, I know who Jesus is. I know what he did. I've been in church. That don't save you. It's the heart. It's that personal relationship with Jesus Christ that saves you. That's where that grace and that peace comes from. You see, and if anyone knew that, it was Peter. Peter knew that. He spent three years with Jesus on, in his ministry on earth. Peter seen all the miracles. Think about the miracles we read about in the Bible. I mean, just think about the blind be being healed with sight. Think about the deaf being able to hear. Think about people born at birth lame, not being able to walk, and now they're walking. Think about the people being uh, raised from the dead back to life. Think about the demon-possessed people. Demons are real, by the way. Side note. Think about the demon-possessed people that were, they were cast out and brought back to restore. They were delivered. Think about sick people being healed. Think about the hungry being fed physically and spiritually. Man. Peter seen all of it. He's seen all of it. Not just that. Think about what he's seen, because they knew the scriptures through the Old Testament. The fulfilling of what Jesus did through Old Testament. Peter knew he was born of a virgin. Peter knew that. Think about Peter saw his ministry begin in Galilee. Peter saw him preach righteousness to Israel. Peter saw him and heard him teach parables. Peter saw him set the captives free. Peter saw him despised and rejected by his own people. 
All these were prophecies. Peter saw him betrayed for silver. All these were in the Old Testament and said when the one comes, the Messiah, this would happen. Peter witnessed every bit of it. Peter got to sit and listen to Jesus teach and preach. He experienced all of it firsthand. Don't you think he knew what that grace and what that peace was, being he was right beside Jesus through all this? And perhaps when Peter was writing this, perhaps he was reflecting back to an event where he really saw this, where he really saw the Lord's understanding of who he was. Perhaps we can think about this. Remember in John 6 when Jesus had just, he had just fed the 5,000. Awesome miracle. They had just seen a miracle. And after that, the crowd followed him. It said a multitude followed him off the mountaintop. When they found Jesus on the other side of the sea in Capernaum, they asked him, when did you get here? They were curious to know Jesus got away from them. When did you get here? Jesus responded, listen, he responded firmly to him. Listen to what he said. He said this. He said, you're wanting to know where I was at for all the wrong reasons. He said this. He said, you're not following me for spiritual satisfaction because of the signs and wonders and miracles. Instead, you're following me for a physical satisfaction. You're following me because I give you some food to eat and you're full. Jesus told him that he was the bread of God. And Angel spoke on this in our class this morning. It confirmed, sister, my notes. He told him, I'm the bread of God, and I came from heaven. He told him, I'm the bread of life, and those who eat of me would never thirst or hunger again. You see, and he told him, he said, just as your fathers ate man in the wilderness, they died. But those who eat the bread of heaven will not die. Jesus was talking from a spiritual standpoint to these people. You see, and to make matters worse, he offended them. They started complaining, murmuring among themselves because he had spoken all this. Guess where he was at? He was in the synagogue in Capernaum when he said this. As a result, the Bible says many, many who were following Jesus left. They abandoned him. They walked away. Then Jesus turns to the twelve. You know what he says? Are you going to leave me too? Listen carefully to what Peter said. Peter said this. He said, Lord, where will we go? You alone had the words of eternal life. You are our only hope. It sounds like to me Peter heard some promises from God through their conversations and teachings. He said, we have believed confidently and trusted in you. And even more, we have came to know you by personal observation and experience that you are the Holy One of God, the Christ, the Messiah. The people left Jesus abandoned. You know why? They didn't know him personally. Can I, can I chase the rabbit here for a second? When COVID hit, some people left the church. They didn't know Jesus personally. I'm just going to be flat out honest with you. When times get bad and people are running from the Lord and they're going different places, they don't know Jesus personally. If you have that personal, intimate relationship with the Lord, I don't care how high gas gets. I don't care who the president of the United States is. I don't care how bad the economy tanks. I don't care what wars are started between what companies. If that causes you to leave the Lord, guess what? You were never saved in the first place. I'm just going to be honest with you. You have to have that personal knowledge of the Lord. Peter saw it. The disciples saw it. When all else left Jesus, when all else said, you know what? I got some good benefits from following the Lord, but now that he's angry and some stuff's going on, I'm just going to walk away. Those people didn't know the Lord. But when they decided to stay and say, Lord, I've heard you speak. I know your promises. I can stand on them. I can rely on them. You and you alone are my only hope. Those people had promises of God, and they stood on them. Can we say the same for us today? Do we truly know that grace and peace of the Lord Jesus Christ? Do we truly have that personal relationship with him? And it all goes back to what Pastor preached on last week. Well, Jesus ain't here in the flesh. No, he's not. But you know what is here? His word. This is from Genesis to Revelation, every book of the Bible. You know what the whole point of the Bible is? It points you to Jesus. And if you go back and study from Genesis to Revelation, every book of the Bible points to Jesus Christ. Every, I don't have time to go through all the books, but do it on your own research. Every book points to him. So, yeah, we don't have Jesus in the flesh, but we have the Holy Spirit, and we have the Spirit of the Word. And those two things combined, I promise you, what did Jesus say? When I leave, I'll bring a comforter. One just like me. Amen. So, yeah, he's not in the flesh here right now, but we have his word. And if we have his word and the truths are in it, it's just like Jesus. Boy, the Lord don't speak to me. Well, when's the last time you read his word? Well, the Lord don't speak to me out loud. Read the Bible out loud. He'll speak to you out loud. The word of God is Jesus Christ. 
I promise. It's okay to give him praise. We can give him praise for being there. That's fine. That's not a problem. So while everyone else was unsettled and not at peace, the disciples, the disciples stayed. You see, maybe the promise they remember was when Jesus told him, my peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. You think perhaps the disciples remember that when everybody else was leaving. He told us to trust in him just to hold on a little bit longer and don't be afraid. The promises of God will bring you peace. Do you have a promise of peace in your life? This is my challenge to you. If you don't have a promise of peace in your life, get one. Get in God's word and pray. Don't use my promise. Don't use your mom and daddy's promise. Don't use your wife's promise. Get your own promise. Get in God's word and pray and really get into his word and dig and study. I promise you he will reveal a promise to you. Somewhere in his word there's a promise that will jump out. And you'll grab it and you'll need it because life happens. You may get off on a work situation and it's chaotic. Lord, I need some peace. This is the promise you gave me. Lord, I'm watching TV and it's just chaotic all over. Lord, I need peace. Lord, I got a bad doctor's report. I need some peace. I promise you in your life, there'll be a coming point in time where you'll need some peace and the promise of peace. Second one is this. God's promises will strategize your steps. Verse 8 said, keep you from being unproductive. You see, Peter was saying that if you personally know the Lord and you're really following him, then the next thing you should do is want him to lead and guide you. Side note again, let me chase this rabbit. These are not in my notes. Holy Spirit's giving me these as I go. We're quick to say when we get saved, Jesus is my Savior. And he absolutely is. That's the truth. He has saved you. But he's your Lord. Have you submitted to him and said, Lord, my whole life I surrender to you. You lead, I will follow. Not, Lord, let me lead and you follow when I need you. That's not how we do it. That's not how Christians do it. A true follower of Jesus Christ, Lord, you lead. Pastor preached this is, you know, I'm just going to get away from the notes for a while. Pastor preached this a while back. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and all his righteousness and all these things to be added. You remember first what he preached on? Your finances, your interest, your relationships, your schedule, and your times of trouble. That pretty much sums up our whole life. If we put those first and seek the Lord in every one of those things, you know what? He'll give us what we need. His, that's a promise in his word. He will give us what we need if we seek him first. But sometimes, and I, I'm here with you, I'm preaching to the choir. I'm not up here saying I'm perfect. My wife will tell you, with us building and things going on, the way they've gone in the economy, prices have been a little higher than we expected going into it. I've sat there at night and said, man, you know, we're going to have to spend a little more than I thought in this area of building or on that area. Finances are, you know, they're getting tight, and we've had to pray. But at the end of the day, the Lord's giving me peace. I opened this up for you for this land. I opened this building process up for you. If I brought you to it, I'm not going to let you fail. I got to have God's peace and assurance of that. That's just being honest. So we, we have to let the Lord lead in all of our decisions. And I, I mean, pray about them. It's important. Pray about what college you're going to go to. Pray about a big one. Pray about who you're going to marry. Pray about who you should be dating Pray about where, what you, the people you should be associating with. Pray about whether to buy a car or not. Nothing's too small. I've heard some people say, well, I don't want to bother the Lord by praying with that. Nothing's too big or too small for God. If it concerns you, guess what? It concerns him. If you're a child of his, it concerns him. Pray before anything. Pray. It's important. I've got sidetracked. We'll get back on. So, however, the more you follow the Lord, the more you grow in a relationship with him, the more productive you will become. And Peter knew this to be true. On several occasions, Peter was bold. We know he was bold. Man, he was bold. But a lot of times his priorities could be out of order. He had a mouth and he spoke before he would think a lot of times. And you're saying, that's a disciple? Yeah, read the Bible. It's in there. Peter, Peter even tried to rebuke Jesus one time. He, 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 he would get out of hand. So he would speak out of turn. He would say things without thinking. He would try to tell the Lord what to do. All this stuff Peter done. And from time to time, Peter would try to do things his way. And he would quickly realize, mm, Lord, I might need to let you lead because this ain't working out for me. And a good example of that, perhaps when Peter was writing this passage about not being productive, perhaps Peter was thinking back to the time when he had a very unproductive fishing trip. If you remember Luke 5, Jesus was teaching, and he was standing on the Sea of Galilee teaching to a crowd. He saw two boats coming in. And the fishermen got out the boats. They started washing their nets and cleaning them. They hadn't caught nothing. Now, this is their career. This is their livelihood. So Jesus got into one of the boats, which was Peter's, and he told him, he said, 
Let's go a little ways out and stop. That's what he did. Jesus started back teaching. I bet Peter's thinking, now he just got in my butt and told me to roll out, and now he's t- teaching him again. I'm just sitting here with him. But listen, after he finished teaching, Jesus said, Peter, go a little deeper. Go just a little bit deeper. Cast your net out. Lower it right. This is the perfect spot. Lower it right here. Peter replied, Master, we have worked all night long to the point of exhaustion. We are tired. We are mentally, physically spent. We have nothing to show. That's, I'm summarizing. He said, but at your word, I will lower my nets. And he lowered them again. And what happened was they had a great catch. They said they caught so many fish. Peter said, hey, other boat, come over here. We got to get fish in two different boats. The Bible says the boat's so heavy, they started to sink. Peter spent all night doing things his way and was unproductive. But at the word of God, just the simple word of God, when the Lord said, go a little further and drop here, Peter became productive on one simple word from God. So while Peter was exhausted and tired doing things his way, the Lord said, hey, let me give you provision. Let me show you where to go. That needs to be us today. We need to be seeking God first, like I said. Simple definition of seeing pastor tell us all the time is when we want to do things our way instead of God's way. 100% of the time, you will fail when you do it your way. You will fail. You will be unproductive. The promises of God will give you provision. So when your life is off track, when you aren't being productive, do you have a promise of provision? If not, let me challenge you today to find one. It's okay to have more than one promise, by the way. I bet you're sitting there thinking, this jugger's telling us to have more than one promise. You can have more than one promise. I promise you can. I have two or three, to be honest with you, and I need them. I need them. But find you a promise. You see, because when things aren't going your way, maybe when life hits and turns you upside down, when you're at a crossroads and don't know what decision to make, that's the time, Lord, I need you. I need you to lead and guide me here. Me and myself, I don't know what to do, but you do. You can lead and guide me. Check your priorities, reevaluate your plans, and make sure they line up with God's word. Because if they don't, you will fail. But if you get a promise from God's word and it lines up, you'll succeed. Jonathan, can you come, brother? I'm on my last point. God's promises will secure your success. Now, don't you listen carefully in this point. Let's not take this the wrong way. I'm not saying, PJ just did an awesome job this about opportunities. I'm not saying if you become saved, you're going to be the best preacher in the world. And on this point, I'm not saying when you become saved that you're going to be able to lay hands on everybody you see and heal them. You'll become known as the greatest healer in the world. That's not what I'm saying here. But listen to what verse 4 says. These promises, the promises of God, will allow you to share in His divine nature and escape the world's corruption. So Peter's writing this because at this time there's false teachers, there's false religions, there's deception going on all around these different Christian communities. The pagans are invading. They're bringing their gods and their worship in. And so now some Christians are being confused. They're like, hmm. You know. So Peter's telling them, hold on to the promises of God. He wanted them to know that if they kept following Jesus, he would give them a way of escape and not fall off. You see, he reminded them if they kept following Christ, if they grow in their relationship with Christ and become more Christ-like in their thinking and in their ways, then they could escape the, the world. You see, Peter knew that people would fall away. Unfortunately, it's going to happen. But he also knew that those who were properly grounded in the Lord with their relationship, they would stand firm. They would fight the good fight and they wouldn't give up. You see, there's a few things about Peter we know. He was a fisherman. And back in Bible times, fishermen weren't the most educated. He didn't come from a rich family, a popular family, so his social and and financial status was not great. You see, it's quite possible Peter didn't even think much about being successful or well-known because of his career, his family, and even his past. But however, Peter didn't realize that after just one encounter with Jesus that he would turn his world upside down. A man went from being a local fisherman to making disciples because there was a powerful promise that was made and Peter couldn't do it on his own Jesus told Peter and other disciples he said go to Jerusalem and wait on the promise of the Father that's the Holy Spirit we're Pentecostal we believe in the Holy Spirit right he said to come upon you and the Holy Spirit will give you power 
even though Peter had many weaknesses, he had many struggles, he had setbacks, the Lord still used him to build a church. Now think about this. Peter is a perfect example of how an ordinary person can do extraordinary things when they allow the Lord to use them and they rely on his promises. Peter was able to minister and spread the gospel to the Jews, the Samaritans, and the Gentiles. Acts 2 tells us this, that after Pentecost and receiving the power of the Holy Spirit, Peter preached to the Jews and 3,000 were saved. That's him preaching to the Jews. In Acts 8, Peter got to preach and spread the gospel to the Samaritans and said many were saved and they were baptized in the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And in Acts 10, Peter got to preach to the Gentiles. That's you and me, by the way. If you're not Jew, you're a Gentile. Conviction fell upon them and it said many were saved. Jesus told Peter when he first met him, what did he tell him? I'll make you fisher of men. Despite his past, despite his flaws, despite his struggles, Jesus saw something in Peter that Peter didn't even see in himself. You know he thinks the same about you today? When he gives you a promise, Lord, I'm, I might not be able to hold up to the promise you give me. That's okay. We're human. We make mistakes. We sin. That's a word a lot of people like to use, but we sin from time to time if we're honest with ourselves. But just as Peter rejected the Lord three times. He tried to rebuke the Lord, but the Lord still used him in a mighty way. Can I tell you today, despite your past, despite your family situation, despite your finances, despite the color of your skin, despite whatever you think bad in your past, is taking, the Lord can use you. He can use you in a real and in a mighty way like you've never even seen. If you just let him, if you just let him speak his words into your life. You see, the promises of God will give you purpose. And I don't know what promise you have today, but can I tell you this? That the Lord's give us the greatest promise of all. The greatest promise of all is a salvation. He promised that He would redeem a fallen mankind. And He did that through His Son, Jesus Christ. He kept that promise. And that promise is still good today. Will you bow your heads and close your eyes with me? If you're here today and you've never accepted that promise, the promise of salvation, the promise of receiving Jesus as your Lord and Savior. I want to offer that to you today. Today's the day of salvation, the Word tells us. The Lord is waiting for you. Can I have some intercessors to come up? The Lord is waiting for you with arms wide open. And He has promises for you that once you come to Him, He will speak specifically to you. And He knows the need that you're facing. And He'll give you what you need in your time of need. also not just a promise of salvation the Lord promises to lead and guide you he promises to love you unconditionally he promises to never leave you he promises to heal your broken heart he promises to comfort you he promises to provide for you to protect you and to preserve you he promises if you're bound and in chains to set you free you can trust in the promises of God. Can I tell you this today? You cannot break God's promises. So you can lean on them and you can stand on them because they're firm. If you need prayer for anything today, for salvation, for healing, if you're worried about a loved one, if you're worried about something at your job, if you're hurt, if you're broken, this altar is open. We have intercessors here and we can get more to come as we tarry for just a little longer. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for your great and your many blessings. Father, thank you for these people who have showed up today, Lord. Thank you for those who have tuned in online. Thank you for your word that you've given us of just how valuable and how important your promises are and how we can hold on to them and how we can trust them, Father, because they are yes and amen. If you're here today and you want to accept the Lord as your Savior and maybe you don't want to come up front, will you just lift your hand and I'll, I'll pray with you from up here in this altar. And if you're online and not saved and you want to put it into the chat, Brother Brian and Sister Heather's back there. They'll reach out to you. 
Father, thank you once again for each and every person who's came out today. Thank you for those who tuned in, Father. We pray your blessings upon your people as we leave and go our separate ways. And Father, we pray for pastors. He comes back. We just pray you lead and guide him, Father, and just protect him, Father. And until we meet again, Lord, protect us all. In Jesus' name, we offer up this prayer. Let it be done. Let it be so. Amen and amen. Thank you, and you're dismissed.